I do want to thank everybody who came today. It means so much to me and I'm just looking and seeing all of the different students and friends and it does mean so much to me to have you here. And I want to start by saying how much I appreciate our administration here at Holmes Community College. Dr. Cox is here today and Myra Harville just introduced me. And I have learned through the last few years how very much we need to appreciate that we have administrators who support the humanities. And I have not always understood that. I think I took it for granted that everyone understood the importance of literature, art, music, history, for us to understand who we are, for us to enjoy our lives and to have meaningful lives. But I have recently learned that is not the case. And so I thank you, Dr. Cox, and I thank you, Dr. Harville, for the commitment that you have to allowing us to have creative writing and literature and music and so many things here for our students. We really appreciate that. And I want to thank uh, my family for coming out to support me today. Uh, I have a brother here. Many of you did not know that I have a brother. I'll just leave it at that, <laughs> and, and you can figure it out later. But uh, my sister Janet Burford is here, and my daughter Whitney and her husband Travis, and my parents Janice and Bobby White, and y'all have always supported me in everything that I have done, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. In fact, my sister was my first student. She was tired of school by the time she started. I'm six years older than she is, and I loved teaching her. And for my parents, thank you for my education and for your commitment to my education. It has meant so much to my life. Well, Martha Kofer, I'm so glad that she is here because I feel that she got me in this. I will never forget the day that she called us into her office and said she had decided that Sissy, Diane, and I should each have the opportunity to teach literature. And I was hoping for American literature that day. It was the one I was most comfortable with. But because Diane had taught British literature at the high school and Sissy was currently teaching American literature, I left hearing that I would teach world literature. <laughs> And so I talked to Jeannie Kelly, one of my colleagues on the Richland campus, and she started talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh. I did not want her to know that I didn't know what she was even talking about. <laughs> so I said, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but since then, it has become one of my favorite works, and I think a favorite work of most of my students. Literature is so important because as we read stories, we have the opportunity to think about who we are and what's important to us. What do we think is right? What do we think is wrong? As we read stories. Every year in world literature, I have my students begin by <coughs> writing their worldview essay. And in their worldview essay, they answer those questions before they even look at any of the text of who are we, how do we relate to other people? How do we relate to a supreme being? How do we achieve happiness? Why is there suffering in the world? All of the questions that we struggle with on a daily basis. And as we turn to literature, we can find answers. And some of those answers satisfy us, some do not. But what I would defend today is that every person has the right to take his or her own journey, to find the answers that seem right to them, and to have an opportunity to discuss with others and share ideas. And I'm so thankful for women who are in here right now that I'm in book clubs with, I'm in Bible studies with, and I thank them that, that they challenge me and, and they make me dig deeper and study harder to see what I think is right and what I think is wrong. So we are going to start today with the Epic of Gilgamesh. But before we do that, I do want to show you a quick little video. Now, our nature please, one of our teachers on the Richland campus, had the opportunity to go to Harvard University for a workshop. And she came back and presented at a state conference that we were at. And that's the first time I really understood the humanities were under attack. I, I live in a little bubble, I guess, and I didn't know that. But when she showed us this video, it was eye-opening to me. And I wanted to show just a portion of it to you today.
My image is a beautiful flower. The stem of the flower is, in fact, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. But the blossom of the flower is the humanities. Without the blossom, the stem is completely useless. It's just a stem. How essential it is that these two areas work in coordination with each other. The sciences are the how, and the humanities are the why. Why are we here? Why do we believe in the things we believe in? I don't think you can have the how without the why. The measurable is what we know, and the immeasurable is what the heart searches for. The humanities are the immeasurable. Philosophy, religion, history, literature, music, culture, the humanities are those subject areas that allow us to really probe what it means to be human. We all need to find who we are and how we fit into the world. The humanities teach us who we are. The humanities are the epitome of human expression. The humanities are what Thomas Jefferson meant when he said the pursuit of happiness. This is not a pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things. This is the pursuit of ideas in a marketplace of our future. Without humanities, life doesn't have life. <laughs> That's at the heart of the matter. Where are we without these things? I would say no humanities, no meaning. No humanities, no soul. No humanities, and no relationships. No humanities, we would be robots. No significance. No fulfillment in life. No history, no present, no future, no us. No concept about the rule of law. No humanities, no civilization. We won't be remembered. There's no end to the spiritual and intellectual evolution that can take place by pursuing the humanities. If we use humanities to its fullest extent in invention, in the sciences, that will propel us into this next century as a very vibrant nation that is creating wealth and is promoting tolerance. So let's start there. So that is the video that our nature showed us that captured my attention and I thought that's exactly right. How many of you are familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh? Yes? No? Gilgamesh is from Mesopotamia, which is the land of the Sumerians, but it's also modern-day Iraq. And the city that, built, that Gilgamesh built was Nineveh. And so it's very important that we go and look. This story is the oldest recorded literature that we have. And students are always a bit skeptical when I say it predates Genesis. And they look like now Ms. Graham. But when I say that, I don't mean that the stories themselves predate Genesis, but that, in fact, um, the actual writing predates Genesis. In fact, we will find Gilgamesh is in Genesis as we talk today. We'll see the character that he is that we are more familiar with. But looking at that ancient text written about 2000 B.C., and he lived 2700 B.C., what we see is from the very beginning, man has had the same questions. And the most important question that Gilgamesh had is how can I achieve immortality? Because there comes a point in his life when he is afraid of death. And I think that's something that most of us face at some point. And he faces it through the loss of a friend. Some of us in here have lived long enough now that we have lost people very dear to us. We've lost siblings, we've lost parents, we've lost friends, and it makes us realize that we are going to die. And that's exactly what happened to Gilgamesh. He realized he was going to die. And at that point, he began that search. So I want to show you again just one qu uh, quick little clip to give you an understanding of the people of that time, of Gilgamesh, and then we will talk more about his story. The 
the Sumerians, who established mankind's most ancient civilization, also created a hero, Gilgamesh. This statue of a hero carrying a lion is said to represent Gilgamesh. The epic of Gilgamesh is recorded on this clay tablet. It is thought to be the oldest story known to mankind. In the life of the hero Gilgamesh, we can see a manifestation of the Sumerian philosophy of life. Gilgamesh was the king of the city-state of Uruk. He had won both fame and recognition. Gilgamesh departs in search of eternal life. However, a goddess appears and admonishes him. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things, day and night, night and day, Dance and be merry, feast and rejoice. Let our clothes be fresh, bathe yourself in water, cherish the little child that holds your hand, and make your wife happy in your embrace. For this too is the lot of man. In the end, Gilgamesh finds that there is nothing he can do and returns to Uruk. He decides to spend the rest of his life carrying out his responsibilities as king. The story reveals how the Sumerians attempted to make the most of their limited existence, enriching and living their lives to the full. Wheat and barley brought further wealth to the people of Sumer. So when the epic began, John, in the epic of Gilgamesh, here we have this mighty warrior king, and yet he is not a shepherd to his people. And we, if we're familiar with that area, which is the same area that Abraham came out of, we understand the importance of the shepherd to use his strength to protect the people, to use his knowledge to lead them to the provisions that they need. And this is not Gilgamesh. In fact, when the epic begins, the people are crying out because Gilgamesh literally takes the young boys and puts them into his service. He takes the virgins on their wedding night before their groom can have them. How much more power and arrogance can a king show than to say, I can have your bride before you have her. She will be mine first. And if there's children even, you will not know if they are mine or yours. So who is this Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh is seen in Genesis and he is the great grandson of Noah. His name in Genesis was Nimrod. You may be familiar with him. And Noah had a son named Ham. Ham had a son named Cush. And Cush had Nimrod. And Nimrod means the rebel or the rebeller. What did he have to rebel about? Well, his father, his grandfather, Ham, if you remember, is the one after they had come off of the ark that he saw his father drunk and naked and he made fun of him. And so he went to his brothers, Shem and Japheth, and he made fun of his father. They went in and they covered their father. And at that point, Noah had cursed him for what he had done. But you know what is so wonderful as I look at this story? Nothing Noah could say could stop what God had said. And God had blessed Noah, and God had blessed his descendants when they came off of the ark. And so no matter how Nimrod, Gilgamesh might act out, you could not change who God is and who he would be and the faithfulness that he would continue to show. And so Gilgamesh, y'all, when, when he's acting the way that he does and the people cry out to their gods, and they are polytheistic at this point, Gilgamesh has actually set himself up against 
the Hebrew God. He blames him. He blames him for the flood. And this is according to Josephus. He blames him for destroying everybody. And so he has set himself up against God. And the people look to Gilgamesh as their God. And when they cry out, the gods send him a friend, Enkidu. And Enkidu does what friends do for us. He gave him more courage. He made him kinder. He made him more compassionate. And he also helped him get in trouble. <laughs> Don't we have friends sometimes that give us just a little too much courage? And that's what happened. And so they decide to take on a goddess. And they, they take her own. And in the end, Enkidu pays the price and dies. And that's when Gilgamesh, in his grief, tears out his hair. And he says, I am afraid. And from that point, he has to go it alone. And he decides that he will go and face Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim is the only immortal. And he is the person who survived the flood. He would compare to Noah in Genesis. And I wonder, y'all, as I'm looking at the epic. Now, we know the epic is not true. We know it is not true because in the epic, Gilgamesh is two-thirds God and one-third man. And it is that one-third man that is the reason that he has to die. And yet it's based on some truth and some legend. And I wonder, in this inward journey, does he go to the one who survived the flood? And Utnapishtim means the distant one because of that great-grandfather, Noah, who had survived the flood. And he begins to think about the stories that he has heard. And when he goes to Utnapishtim in the epic, Utnapishtim says, you really don't want to live forever because nothing is permanent. No people live forever. Houses don't stand forever. Agreements between brothers don't stand forever. It's actually very lonely to be the only person who will live forever. But Gilgamesh still wants to live forever. And so he says, well, I'm going to give you a test. If you pass, you can live forever. Of course he fails. And so at that point, he gives him a plant. And he says, if you partake of this, you will be young again. Well, Gilgamesh, who knows? Has he changed? Or is he going to check it out on some other people first? But he's taking it back to the old men first. And he takes a bath. And in the bath, a serpent of all things comes up and snatches the plant away. But Gilgamesh does not fall into despair at that point. Instead, he accepts his lot, that he is mortal, that he is going to die, and that the only way to be immortal is to do all the good that you can and to be remembered fondly by people. Maybe because he's remembering Noah. But I don't know about y'all, when I read that text, that does not satisfy me. Just do all the good that I can while I'm here and then I will cease to exist and maybe somebody will build a statue for me or maybe they'll speak fondly of me around the bridge table or whatever. That just doesn't do it for me. Because as King Solomon said, God placed eternity in our breasts, didn't he? That we know we were meant to live forever. I told you that God is faithful, our God. And so let's leave Gilgamesh now and let's move to the book of Jonah. And there's the city of Gilgamesh, Nineveh. Well, now you all know this story, and I wish we had time. We do not. There is the most precious little girl. Her name is Mary Margaret. You need to make a mental note of that. And she tells the story of Jonah. We listened to it in class yesterday, and I think the students thoroughly enjoyed her rendition of Jonah. But here is Jonah, this prophet. And where is he told to go? Nineveh. He is told to go to the place where Noah's descendants are, who are living in open rebellion, who are practicing every kind of sin. And he is told to go there and to preach and to warn the people that he is going to punish them for their wickedness. Jonah's a little bit like us. While his God is not judgmental, he is very judgmental. He does not want to do it. And so he decides that he will just run away. And he goes and boards a ship. Don't we do that sometimes? I mean, as I read those stories, I can just relate on a human level. And you start to see how we don't change. We're the same people that man has been from the very beginning. 
And he gets on that ship and he goes in and he goes to sleep and we know what happened. The storms come and, and the people pray to their gods and there's nothing that they can do. And so they go down and they tell Jonah, wake up, what is wrong with you? And you know what I wondered? Is he so determined not to see what is around him that he can sleep? Or even in this storm when he has disobeyed his God, does he have peace? We don't know because Jonah doesn't tell us. But I like to think that once we have encountered God, we have peace. No matter what the situation, no matter what the storm, and even when we know deep in our hearts we've done wrong, there is peace. That we know that we have a God who will forgive us. And so Jonah has to come out and admit that he's the problem. And he says, you've only got one option here, guys. Throw me overboard. And they are better people than he is. And they said, oh, we can't do that. He said, you have to. So they did. And God had planned for the big fish to come swallow him. We know that story. And he stayed in that fish for three days and three nights. That's how long it took before he finally prayed and repented. And I loved what he said in his prayer because he said, I know that you are the Lord of my salvation. And I'm sorry, Lord. And immediately that fish spits him in. And Jonah goes and does what he was supposed to do all along. He tells the people of Nineveh they need to repent. And they do. And he is not happy. He wanted them to be punished. And aren't we that way sometimes? And so he goes and sits and pouts because he realizes that they are not going to be punished. But the words that he says at that point, knowing my life and the decisions that I make sometimes, speak truth to me. He says, For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. When I hear those words, I just, my heart knows that that is the truth. That was the God in the Hebrew scripture. That is the God in the Greek New Testament. That is the God who is alive today. One who is slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and who relents if we're just willing to repent. Well, later in Scripture, in the book of Matthew, Jesus of Nazareth is talking to some Pharisees, and they say to him, We want a sign that you are who you say you are. And he says, No sign will be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And so here we are. We're just coming full circle. We had Gilgamesh, Nimrod, who had rebelled. And yet God had been gracious and sent that opportunity to his people to repent, and now we have Jesus saying, that's your sign, that's your sign. And another Pharisee goes to Jesus later and says, how can I be saved? And those words come when Jesus says to him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? eternal life. That thing that Gilgamesh had been looking for. And as I said, I know y'all that we arrive at different answers, but we have the same questions. And we have the right to go looking for those answers. And we need to have people in our circle of influence who are also truly seeking the right answers who will talk with us, discuss with us, pray with us. And I'll tell you, what I'm doing right now is not something that I do in class, and my students will tell you that, because I respect that they are young adults, and they are searching for their answers. And I, I see one nodding, and I thank you for that, because I do not try to impose on my students the answers that I feel that God has given to me. 
but how I thank him for the ancient text and how I thank him that every question my heart has ever had has been answered in that book. And I thank my parents so much for teaching me that that book would be the compass that would guide me throughout my life. And it has guided me. And I encourage you, if you're seeking, that that is one of the places you should look. King Solomon said that if we do not have meaning and we do not have purpose outside of the things of this earth, then life is meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Thank y'all so much.